Hello, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I spoke with professional magician and podcaster Brian Brushwood. Brian is probably best known for his web series, Scam Nation, where he teaches you entertaining tricks to scam free drinks from your friends. He also co-hosts a YouTube show called The Modern Rogue and recently launched World's Greatest Con, a podcast that brings you the hidden stories behind the most audacious con jobs, swindles, and heists in history. I reached out to Brian because I wanted to learn more about the psychological tools that magicians use to fool their audiences. A couple parts of our conversation stood out to me. One being the sheer amount of effort and planning that can sometimes go into a good trick. I realized that one of the reasons why magic is so mysterious is because the audience doesn't imagine just how far the magician will go to create an effect. The second realization I had from our conversation was that learning magic provides you valuable knowledge about deception. While magicians use this knowledge to entertain, others will use this knowledge to exploit human cognition for personal gain. I strongly recommend educating yourself about the principles that magicians use to fool people so that you can protect yourself from someone trying to deceive you. Hopefully this interview is a good start. Enjoy. Okay, I'm here with uh, Brian Brushwood. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I am so excited to have a real grown-up, an academic, who can explain to me all the things that I don't understand. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I'm going to be providing that today, but uh, we'll definitely have a good conversation. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about... Uh, magic today, uh, the psychology of magic, uh, also sort of the psychology of deception, perhaps. Um, why don't you just start by talking about uh, your personal journey through magic? Because you have experience with magic and, and, and then also magic adjacent uh, uh, ventures. So why don't you just start, talk, start talking about your, your journey through magic and some of the directions that that kind of training led you to? Sure. Uh, I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I did something called the Plan 2 program, where it's a very, very flexible program. It's a liberal arts thing where the first two years, they pretty much be what you take. In the last two years, you take whatever is related to your thesis. And at the time, I thought I was pulling a fast one on the university saying, oh, you know, I'm kind of into magic. And then they said, oh my God, and you want to do a magic show as a creative writing thesis. What a great idea. And that was not what I wanted to do, but I was, right. but I knew a good thing when I heard it. So I was like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. So I went on to take uh, classes in uh, psychology, the history of witchcraft, uh, 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 pseudoscience and the paranormal, languages of science fiction, uh, ended up doing a 40 minute stage performance as my senior thesis, graduated and uh, dabbled in computers for a little bit, always doing gigs on the side. And then uh, around May of 1999, I got a raise and realized, oh wait, this is how you get trapped doing something you hate for the rest of your life. So <laughs> if there's ever gonna be a chance to be a magician, this is my moment. So I jumped off, uh, my wife said, you got one year and uh, I, you know, took every gig you can imagine. Um, eventually found a, a match in the college market where you and I first encountered each other. Uh, and uh, I, I was always fascinated by sort of a magic show for people who hate magic shows, which is a tough lane to pick because it means you have to show that you love magic, but also show that you understand why people would hate magic shows. Uh, sure. And and uh, so so, what I ended up with was uh, a very Penn and Teller-ish kind of, you know, subversive commentary meets mentalism, mind reading, physical stunts, sideshow kind of thing, Jim Rose show uh, kind of stuff. And uh, around 2008, I started doing a show called uh, Scam School, where we taught uh, bar scams and tricks to real people at the bar, which was, as far as I understood, something nobody was doing. Like, if you were going to learn a magic trick from YouTube, it would be a pair of hands in front of a webcam 
uh, it would certainly not be on location, not with high def cameras, and most certainly not using real people and insisting that they demonstrate that they've learned the trick by performing it back to you. Uh, but that seemed to go really, really well out of that. I ended up hosting uh, National Geographic's uh, Hacking the System uh, and its spiritual successor, The Modern Rogue. And nowadays, um, uh, probably one of the most exciting things I've gotten to do is uh, share stories on the new podcast, World's Greatest Con. So so now a, 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 a guy who does a lot of things, I guess, would be the short version. Definitely a jack, jack of all trades uh, when it comes to uh, deception. <laughs> or as my wife would say, a jackass of all trades. <laughs> it's even better. Um, so uh, the uh, one thing I, I get interested in uh, thinking about magicians and the the variation and how they present themselves is that um, is that every magician sort of makes some sort of agreement with the audience, not necessarily like not necessarily explicit, but there's sort of a uh, an agreement made in the sense of some magicians will like to blur the lines between uh, whether or not they're doing tricks or whether or not they have powers and i know supernatural powers yeah supernatural power and I, and i think this is getting less common at least hopefully it's getting less common but um what was so what was the agreement that you would make with the audience what how did you view this kind of question in terms of presenting yourself so for me personally uh it is something that i spent a few years sort of making a firm decision on and where i ended up was if i'm on stage i'm lying if I'm off stage, you are a real human being and I'm telling you the truth. So if I'm on stage, I will casually mention how I was struck by radioactive lightning and it bestowed upon me the awesome super colossal power of a uh, supernatural smell. And I will say this with a straight face and I will not break character. But the moment the show's over, if somebody says, I'm so glad that you were struck by that radioactive lightning. Uh, listen, my dog's been missing for three weeks. Will mm. you please help me hunt? Daisy down. Uh, I will be very quick to say, oh, that was a stage show. I am a human being. Um, it turns out that that seductive power of telling a wonderful story, that incredible moment of serendipity when you happen to guess somebody's name of a dead relative or what have you, is so powerful that a lot of magicians have a hard time letting that go. And instead, they'll use wiggle words. Uh, they'll they'll say, uh, for example, um, you know, oh, you know, nothing supernatural is happening. I use all of my five senses to create the illusion of a sixth sense, uh, which, yes, you're accurate, but that person is almost certainly on the drive home going to believe that you have a skill when really all you did was have have a sneaky second piece of paper in your back pocket or something. Yeah. And even more, even more uh, bothersome is I, I've seen some magicians where they, because I mean, let's be honest, all, all tricks have sort of a built in kind of story. And sometimes the, good ones the story, do, certainly <laughs> right. Uh, some of them, you know, I've, I've heard, magicians say that they're using body language and nonverbal cues. And, you know, as soon as I yeah. hear that, my bullshit meter goes off. Um, and I, I, you I, know. I, I am definitely guilty of that. And boy, is that ever a powerful routine that 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 plausible possibility that you are a genius of micro uh, expressions or or that you're looking at eye dilations which there is some truth to you know you can uh, show someone five cards and and have them select one and then you can one at a time this is something you could do with your friends right now you could sh uh, after they pick a card you could show them one at a time and when their selected card shows up you will be able to see the eye dilation uh, on there however in the world of magic it's much easier to have a marked deck of cards to, or to force a card and then use the conceit of I'm looking at eye dilations. So in that way, you blur the lines and you're doing it for the right reasons. You're, you're, you're doing it for, for narrative punch and it is based in reality. But again, to me, the very 
the very simple bright line is on stage or off stage. So mm -hmm. on stage, I will do exactly that thing where I claim to be reading body language or you blink twice when you said whatever, I'm pretty sure that means whatever. Uh, but, but the moment the show is over, I will make it very clear to anybody who asks that, uh, uh, no, I was on stage. Everything is a lie. Now, let's talk. Can, could you talk more about uh, the story behind uh, a magic trick? And, and, and if there's anything that you've learned from trying out different, uh, different narratives, because, you know, I, I've listened to some podcasts talking about magic tricks, uh, you know, listen to Pendulette talk about sort of debates about uh, in the middle of a trick, you know, do you, there has to be a moment where the magic happens. It's kind of this concept of there's a finger snap or uh, um, it's a finger snaps the, the sure, only sure, example sure, I can sure, come sure. up with, but uh, what, in, in, in how the case important of, is that story? Yeah. Um, those are narrative conceits and I do agree that they belong there. Uh, and, and sometimes I'll even throw in literal nonsense where it's like, and now I will remember the memory of my grandfather's hairline. And now your card has come to the top. It doesn't <laughs> right. matter whatever that thing is. It's like, it's like narratively, just like we like a three act structure, just like there's something narrative to uh, the power of the hero's journey, or as uh, Dan Harmon, creator of community puts it, uh, the story circle, like there's, there, there's something primal all the way back to when we're all sitting around a campfire as cave people to, to now. And rather than fight against that, it's easier to go along with it. Uh, it. But you do have to figure out like, what is your truth that you're saying? Uh, Pendulette holds himself to a very high standard. Uh, and in fact, there are people who have even higher standards. There was one magician who refused to ever lie even as he performed. So he would carefully craft every single word of a routine. So at no point, while he would heavily imply that this is your card, he would never, ever, not even once lie. Uh, that sounds like a lot of trouble. I rather like the simple distinction of, if I'm on stage, I'm lying, slash telling a story. If I'm off stage, you're a human being and we're really talking. Right, right. Um... So let's let's dive into uh, let's dive into actually performing the tricks and some of the the principles that magicians use. Now, you, you know, you mentioned before we started recording uh, that that you hesitate to call magicians experts in attention, perception, etc. Uh, that their experience they're they're more like folk experts because it's all experience based. There's no double blind placebo controlled studies, but you're right. definitely aware that they have that that magicians exercise these principles to make the tricks happen, right? Things like misdirection. Could you talk about a couple uh, of of those principles that magicians rely on to create? Sure, sure, effects? sure, sure. So, uh, and, and to be clear, just in case my fellow uh, uh, magic brethren are listening, what I mean by this is uh, we are definitely experts in the what or the uh, how how to make somebody believe that you're contacting their dead relative, how to get that card to the top of the deck, how to make it feel like we read their mind. We are definitely experts in the how. Uh, a lot of magicians get really excited to be experts in anything, and they confuse that for the uh, being experts in the why we are fooled by certain things. And that to me is, that's not our realm. We are not neuroscientists. We don't have fMRI machines. We're not doing double blind uh, uh, placebo controlled studies or any of that stuff. And I think it's important uh, to to distinguish between the two. But in terms of the fundamentals of the how, um, one example, and maybe somebody you should have on the show, is a friend of mine, Nate Staniforth. Uh, he recently put together a, a magic theory course, and he sent me three three little snippets. And I think each one is a, a really good uh, a fundamental shift for a lot of people. Uh, one is uh, the parable of the two robbers. And he describes one scenario where a guy puts on a ski mask, walks in, flashes a gun, puts a duffel bag out, puts a note out that says, fill it with money uh, and nobody gets hurt. Walks out and goes. 
when the cops show up in that scenario, the cops are all asking the right question. What face was under that mask? And that is the exact right question. Uh, uh, question. And in fact, uh, there's enough cameras everywhere that you can see the camera of him exiting. You can see the camera from across the street. You can see the camera at the 7-Eleven. You can see the car he gets into. You can trace the license plate, all of that stuff. Exact same scenario. Imagine somebody walks in without a mask, a middle-aged man, 60 years old, a snake tattoo on his chest, uh, or, you know, on his neck, um, uh, 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 limping, uh, uh, glasses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, that person does the exact same thing. Only that person walks out into the crowd with a bunch of other 60 year old somethings and then turns a corner, peels off the high quality prosthetic mask that, that this person was wearing and becomes a 26 year old PhD female student. And uh, uh, at that point, Every single person giving their account to the police will, will have striking detail about exactly who. So it will never occur to the police to ask the right question. The right question mm -hmm. being, of course, who's under that mask because nobody even thinks of there being a mask. Uh, and instead, they're going to be focused on, yeah, but then where did he go? And they're right. going to be looking in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, the, the second of the lessons was what Nate calls a, uh, a logic trap. Uh, which is basically, um, uh, oh man, I don't, I don't know if we have enough time for it, but it's a well, very that, good video. So the uh, that first, the first idea, in in terms of basic, you know, performance of magic, is is it is it the idea that that's that when you present, when you present a reality that doesn't make any bells and whistles go off you can kind of assume people aren't going to, people won't notice anything if it doesn't look out of the ordinary. Is that part of the, is that part of what, what the lesson there is? Yes. So, um, uh, for example, uh, your, your big challenge, whenever you're intentionally deceiving somebody, uh, for narrative pur purposes is to figure out what is not extraordinary. So let's say that you found out this Wednesday there's going to be a, a magic show at a coffee shop that you go to every single week. Right. You know this coffee shop. When you show up for the show, the only thing that is new and novel is the magician, the bar stool, the uh, uh, briefcase, and the lighting. All your attention are on those things. You absolutely will not see all of the things that are not extraordinary to you because these are familiar to you. Um, uh, I, I call this weaponizing the venue and it's sort of the foundation of, <clears throat> of scam school is, is basically figuring out how to take things that you see so often at a bar that they're above suspicion. I casually shrug and say, I don't know, grab me a coaster over there. It would never occur to you that I showed up earlier and secretly wrote on the underside of 25 coasters uh, a <laughs> particular prediction, right? Yeah. Uh, but 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 uh, because it's above reproach, because it's so familiar, that is a blind spot to you. But of course, that is gold to me, the person who wants to deceive you. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it, it it it's it's funny how in practice magicians probably don't necessarily um, have to do a ton of research into cognitive psychology to make these effects happen, but they're all kind of based in, in, in a lot of, a uh, lot of deep, you know, long-term research that's been done in terms of, you know, people like, like you, basically what you said, like there's an entire area of research that suggests that people don't notice things that they're used to seeing over and over again. And it's, it, it's always fascinating to me that, that um, that there's there's overlap with cognitive psychology in magic, even though you don't have to learn psychology to do a good magic trick. You just you learn the practical applied aspect of it. Yeah, and uh, not to make it sound like magic is easy, but uh, <laughs> a way that anybody without any training or any skill, if you can remember ten things, you can create a miracle. So let's say you and I intended to meet and we agreed on what bar we were going to hang out at. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say it's a bar, hopefully it's a bar that you've been to many times and you say, I've been there, you know, it'll be great. 
and I tell you I'm flying in on Thursday, you're like, that'll be awesome. I would like to take you to my favorite bar. Blind spots. I would immediately identify blind spots. One blind spot is a thing that you would never, ever, ever suspect is that I would, one week before we were going to meet, put on a fake mustache, fly out to your city, not tell anybody, go and meet the, lo- the names of the local, ask questions, pretend to be you know undercover or whatever, tape a, a, a $1 bill with a serial number that I've memorized underneath uh, uh, one of the benches, right. uh, a plant a playing card, you know, set up 75 different things in there and then fly home and then fly in, do my gig, wait casually and be totally cool. We're like, I don't know, wherever you want to go. And then here's the big, mo- it's a big moment, of course, because you could say, oh, I don't know, let's go to McDonald's, in which case all my effort is wasted. But <laughs> right. if you say, let's go to McGillicuddy's Bar and Grill, uh, the place I happen to have reconned beforehand, you're, you're about to have a miracle of a night. And out of the 75 things that I planted, maybe I do two of them, but all of them feel totally organic. All of them feel like uh, they were spontaneous and in and of the moment. And all I've done is preset a bunch of landing places yeah. and wait for the natural branching tree of possibilities to reveal which one we do. Yeah, um, to, and, and that speaks to these these two ideas in magic that I find super, super interesting. Uh, one magic is super dirty in the sense that the average person will not have a framework to understand how far a magician will cheat in order to create some effects because there's always kind of an assumption, even though they're, they're going to show them an illusion, there's still an assumption of trust that when you, when you explain, when you're giving your pattern, you're explaining this trick, a lot of people just kind of take what you're saying as truth for the most part. I love that magic is dirty. And I also love how uh, most people that are witnessing magic won't, um, won't imagine they cannot imagine how much effort actually went into creating something so tiny some tiny little effect and i love those i love that aspect about magic could you uh you know could you talk about this this kind of unspoken trust that you have with the person that you're performing for and and why you know the role of cheating and and how that 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 kind of violates that trust that goes back and forth Sure, sure. So uh, two things. Number one, here's a wonderful trick to know how any magic trick is done. It is astonishing to me how often people say, I once saw a magician do blank. And uh, do you have any idea how they did that? And I say, I want you to imagine that I told you for a fact that in 20 minutes, cameras were going to show up and you were going to be live on national television performing that exact trick under those restrictions how would you do it and invariably what they say is exactly the right method followed by the words but that would be stupid (laughs) (laughs) that's hilarious (laughs) so so if you if you want to know uh uh, how it's done just think of how you would do it and if you feel that tickle of but that would be stupid then that's almost certainly how they did it. Uh, Because what people want to believe is that there's something so complicated they can't possibly uh, have thought of it. Uh, Spoiler alert, you can, and you did, and you will. Uh, As as, as far as the the, uh, second part was uh, uh, trust, right? Yeah. So there's a couple of different frameworks for how a magic show should go. And one of my favorite conversations with Teller, of Penn & Teller, was, he talks about the difference between a narrative play versus a magic show. In a narrative play, you get the benefit of a uh, metaphor. If, if I'm doing a play for you and I pick up a stick and hold it up and say, this is a sword. If you're watching a play, you get to say, okay, yeah, no, I get it. All right, starting now, I'll think of that as a sword. All right. That's not magic. In magic, if I say this is a sword, 
it needs to visibly, without the consent of the audience, transform into a sword in front of your face. Then you're doing magic, right? Mm -hmm. So there's an expectation, and that's something wonderful about doing anything that has the word magic in it. Um, uh, my stage show is a mix of uh, sideshow stunts, of, uh, of, of, of magic and comedy, and uh, I wanted to imply that some amount of what I was doing was real, which is why I always called it bizarre magic. Uh, uh, it, it, and that helped people, number one, not book me for children's birthday parties. Number two, uh, <laughs> uh, put them in a place where, like, uh, I think the first magic trick I do in my show is the fourth routine in. Uh, the first three are like, I eat fire, I hammer a four and a half inch nail in my nose, I, I run 30 foot of uh, uh, tubing all around my body, out my nose, out my mouth. And so by the fourth routine, uh, the purpose of that is to lure you into, I mean, I guess this guy's just doing all of this. And then <laughs> the fourth routine is the first time, like I'm halfway through cutting off my tongue and then people are like, nope, nope, this is a magic show. It's very unlikely he's actually cutting off his tongue right now. But for a half second, I, I, I was there and had that moment of wonder. So uh, when it comes to trust, again, we're talking about the onstage versus offstage thing. But nowadays, especially in the world of digital magic, where you might have a TikTok video where somebody is doing some editing that uses some foundational and important magical principles, but uh, just digitally uh, and, and, and not real time, um, the old timers will begrudge this. To me, it seems pretty obvious that this is a natural evolution of the art. Uh, uh, I love the metaphor of uh, the job of a magician as a master chess player. There are two ways. Let's say your job as a magician is to swoop into a town, blow everyone away, and get lost, right? right. Change, change the words. Your job is to come in, play chess with everyone in the village, and then leave the champion. Now, there's two ways you can do that. One way is to study all the book moves, uh, study all of the great matches, uh, uh, practice against an AI, uh, 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 learn from all the other great masters. That's very, very hard, also very, very rewarding. And th that is my school of thought when it comes to magic. I want as many people to know as many things about magic as they can because that makes it a more rewarding experience to checkmate them. The other way to guarantee that you get to be the best chess player in the village is to say, I want a law to be passed that nobody shall know the rules of chess, uh, of chess uh, except uh, right. for me, right? right. And, and the, the, insecure, the insecure version, right? Yeah. Technically, that works, right? That's what we saw in vaudeville. That's what we saw sure. in, in the early days. Yeah. Uh, and in a world where there's no legal framework to protect magic secrets, we've relied on publicly shaming individuals for ripping off routines. Um, we've relied on lying about the routines. That's part of the reason that we get these false explanations where it's like the real method is I forced you this card or these cards mm -hmm. are marked but I must not say that. So instead, the show is over and I lie to your face saying, well, your eyes dilated or I noticed that you blinked twice or whatever, which to be honest is the worst of all worlds because it, number one, it scratches that itch of the person of wanting to know how it's done, but it doesn't even bother to scratch it with the right answer. And it right. does a disrespect to the craftsmanship that went into your routine. Yeah. Um and you know what I've always I, you know, probably di probably differs from person to person, but what I've always liked is the um, is when you when, when I've practiced certain card moves, and then I can go to you know now I can go to YouTube and watch someone perform card magic or card manipulations and stuff like that, and it's impressive. It, like I'm only interested in the skill like the skill the practice and the you know i, I wow like you, you see someone vanish a car and it's like it it would take me weeks to learn that and it's really impressive um i wonder uh, you said it's kind of evolving so do you think it's more going towards that where you know the internet you can look up 
just about anything. There is no hiding, or well, it's far less uh, easy to hide secrets now with with information and, and YouTube. Is, so, do you think that's that's the direction we're going in, where it's more skill based? I uh, I don't. Uh, or, or let me put it this way: um, I do, but the skill is not the skill that you think it is. Um, Thirty years ago, when I first started getting in, into magic. If, if I were to ask everybody, hey, how would you feel about a magical future where no matter what magic trick you ever performed, anybody could reach into their pocket and get the answer of how it was done? Would you think that's good or bad for magic? And everybody across the board would say clearly bad, right? right. right. And yet that is the actual world that we live in right now, 30 years later. And 30 years from the moment I started in magic, we now live in a world where magic is more respected than it's ever been in my entire life. It's more popular than it's ever been in my entire life. There are more movies about it. There are more successful uh, artists. There are even new branches of magic that are being created. Uh, back in the day, when I first started a magic, somebody who took a bunch of cards, flung them all around and did clever spins and everything, that would, that would be called derisively finger flicking. And it would be a bad mark. It would be like, okay, if you want to fool people, you shouldn't show them that kind of stuff because that's just going to make them think that you did it with your ledger domain juggling skills. Uh, mm -hmm. And instead, it's become a whole branch of its own in the world of magic called cardistry. And, and I think it's overall a good thing. Um, so uh, uh, I, I, again, um, to me, the skill, the real skill is storycraft. And if any magician wants to get into it with me about uh, about the fact that that 30 years ago, it used to be about the secret or it used to be about the practiced method of turning over five cards, but making it look like three or whatever. Uh, and nowadays you're reduced air quotes to uh, having to craft a wonderful story that is so enchanting that people forget to look at your fingers. I'm very, very very happy for where we are right now and i'm happy for whatever part i've played in in the democratization of magic methods yeah i uh, it is uh it is comforting to know that that the the narrative or the story is still super important if if anything we've become more aware of how important telling a story is even in i mean not just not just in performance but i mean I, you know i was in analytics for uh, a, a reasonable period of time. And even then, like at some point it, it all comes down to, can you tell a story with data? <laughs> right. It's not yeah, the, yeah. Me the methods, the methods are kind of the, <laughs> I, I hope this metaphor works out, but the methods, there's kind of a sleight of hand going on or misdirection where it's like, well, well, yeah, well, everyone sure. thinks, I, I, can, yeah. can, can, can I make a guess? Uh, my guess is the method. So uh, you are given raw data and by the way, this is pure speculation and I sure. hope I land this, I hope <laughs> I get it right, but I don't know much about this field, but I'm gonna guess that you begin with an initial landscape of numbers and there's no context to any of them. And it's your job to apply the filter. Number one, separate numbers that matters uh, uh, from numbers that don't. Figure out what the story is, simplify that story, visualize that story. That's one of my favorite subreddits is uh, uh, data is beautiful because right. they figure out how to take those raw numbers and tell very simple visual stories that are meaningful, emotionally meaningful to the person who's consuming it. And that, yeah. that, that is the job of an analyst. Uh, oh, please right. let me be right. Yeah. I, well, yes. And, and to add on to that, the, the worst part is typically executive leadership wants they want um, they want flashy statistical models, which in the magic world would be let, forget making a good trick. Let's just buy a really cool gimmick. Let's buy this giant box that makes people you know that, that it makes sure, it look sure. like I'm I'm cutting someone in half, which is that's that's part of magic. But that's not the that's not the point. The, the point, the essence and, and what makes it great is the story. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, well, was, that and, was a good and, analogy. Uh, I, I think it bears it out whether the magic effect is done with a deck of cards or a single coin right in front of your face, one to one, or whether it's performed live on stage with a very fancy box 
that involves an optical illusion that makes it look like a body was cut in half, you'll notice that the best of breed in either environment are probably talking about uh, the last time they saw their mom cry or something fundamental or powerful, you know, yeah, uh, it's, very personal. Uh, like, like th th there's, uh, that's part of what made uh, David Copperfield such a master of, of the medium of television is because he understood like somebody, I don't know, I don't have insight in info on this, but in my imagination, knock, 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 hi, I got a chemical you could blow uh, all over theaters across America. Uh, I, I, it's this white powder. It's like, well, what does it do? It's like, I don't know, it dissolves after about an hour. Okay, uh, how do you blow it? It's like, well, you take these giant fans and you just blast it everywhere. Okay, that doesn't sound like a magic trick. And yet, the genius of David Copperfield is talking about something universal, something powerful, something like a child who wanted to see it snow. And, and uh, as my friend Mike Super does in his show, he tells the, the true tale of uh, how his mom passed away and she happened to pass away before he ever saw his first snow. And so when those fans blow that chemical everywhere, I'm getting choked up thinking about I, I, like, it's a great, it. It is a great, great ending. Right? right? I, and, yeah. and all of a sudden it's powerful and awesome. Uh, yeah, Mike, uh, more Mike people Super, playing that you game. can probably YouTube. Uh, I, 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 I would well, imagine right. it just occurred available. to me that you almost certainly have seen him do this bit. Yeah, uh, I have. Uh, I would I would ask everyone to, to check that out. Uh, on the same note, uh, I think one of the, the more uh, at least a, a wonderful melding of magic and storytelling was a special by a, a guy by the name of Derek Del Gaudio um, that was on Hulu. And, you know, I, he just some. I mean, really push the limits uh, behind, uh, you know, not just having a lighthearted narrative, but a really deep, deep, dramatic uh, narrative that combined with the tricks. The tricks were, I mean, the tricks, it was more like the tricks highlighted the story versus the other way around. The tricks weren't the focus. The story was the focus. The tricks just kind of were the punchline and, and kind of added added some some magic to the performance to, to the moment and and that's one of the things that um i remind young magicians is that um uh i'll say uh well do me a favor rehearse your whole show right now and then they'll say uh, uh well i don't have any of my props and i'll be like if you if you need your props then your story needs work uh because mm -hmm. what you should be able to do and part of this comes from uh, I, I taught magic uh, for a couple of years at a camp up in the Pocono Mountains uh, while I was in college. And we would literally tell the kids, all right, I want you to rehearse this five times by tomorrow. And they would say, well, do I take the deck of cards with me? And I'm like, no, what, why would you need the deck of cards? You're going to rehearse. Uh, it's the story that matters. So I'm always curious to talk to people about uh, that, that have had repetition with similar activities over and over again specifically uh, you've had this opportunity to perform tricks to people and learn how they react you've seen tons and tons of you've had a large data set of people reacting to magic and 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 how that, that might vary from person to person is there anything that that you've taken from seeing uh, how are there any patterns to how people react that sort of you found interesting over the years so anybody who plays an instrument in my mind is better than me because uh i rely on trickery and 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 a loose tongue to weave a narrative and lie and pretend that like i have actual credit meanwhile a juggler a musician or anybody else like there's no denying that they put a lot of repetition into essentially uh, their scales, right? right? So it's like, whereas to me, if I try to play a song on a piano, I have to decode every single note one at a time and, and, and I can memorize it, but you know, I, like I've learned how to play Lady Madonna uh, on the piano or whatever, but, um, but it might as well, that's just me reciting gobbledygook. Whereas anybody who has learned all the scales, they can glance at sheet music. And where I see a number of letters, they see a full 
word or sentence or phrase like right. like and quite honestly you could write down on there it's like yeah it starts with this then it goes to this scale then you do some of this and then there's the other thing and they're like yeah and then suddenly they're playing an actual song um when it comes to magic uh, I, I, I'm, I'm loath to admit to having any talent at all, but if I do have <laughs> any talent, it is in doing the scales of branching opportunities, recognizing and reading the audience when they react. So if I begin with a thing, there are things that you look for that are very, very, very subtle. And, and I'm dangerously close to doing the exact same thing I just excoriated a few minutes ago. <laughs> but you notice the micro expression of the, the, the clenched eyes when I, and, and I intentionally avoid saying, this is a normal deck of cards, because why would you say that? That means it must not be an ordinary deck of cards. Yeah, or yeah it's the like, eye squint. Maybe you see an eye squint or something. Yeah, yeah I mean, right. So. And, and, or, or, or and, and in which case, if you see, let's, for, exa for example, you pull out a deck of cards and you instantly see that disgust look on somebody's yeah. face, uh, then the first words out of my mouth will be, I hate card tricks, because I can tell this person thinks they know where this is. I hate every single card trick that has ever been, except for this one. And the reason I don't mind this one is because it reveals the truth about God. <laughs> and then I'll notice on their face whether or not I've landed. If I've not landed, maybe they wince again. It's like, and by God, I mean, there is no God or whatever. It's like, like, like I'll figure out whatever it is to, to take, to connect. Right. It's, it's like a, it's like two modems doing a handshake and eventually you get on the same wavelength. Uh, but, but, but once you get there, you begin to feel that narrative flow and you can tell when it's the right time to punch out. For example, imagine a scenario where the plan is to have a card selected signed or whatever have them pick a random card they pull it out and that's going to be a marker card and then they flip it over and then what if by chance they happen to flip it over and it happens to be the exact card that they put in there that's a one in 52 chance not impossible my job is to know to stop the routine right there and do yep. a different trick after that Right. Uh, uh, so, so in that regard, you begin to only by repetition, begin to recognize, you know, what tends to be initial skepticism, uh, uh, uh initial reluctance to participate in the process, a reward, a reward, uh, 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 for example, um, uh, like I always try to begin with a gift, something that doesn't require anything of them. And then I, I counter with a question. I was like, did you like that? And they'll be like, yeah. Or what they'll say is do it again. And I'll say, oh, did you like that? I answer a question with a question and they're like, yeah. And it's like, do you want to see another? What are they, what are they going to say? No, right. they have to say, yeah. It's like, okay, now I'll make a small ask and I'll build from there, that kind of thing. So th this is a perfect transition, this kind of one-on-one -on -one dynamic uh, for doing tricks, a perfect transition to talk about um, about the the types of, tricks that you uh, show off in scam school and, and some of your other videos. So uh, for the listeners, this would be the difference between it's not quite it's, it's definitely not stage magic. It's 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 not even up close magic. It's more little games or scams or little uh, tricks to, 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 you know, maybe there's stunts. money on the line stunts is yeah. Um, could you talk about um, uh, in this, in the, in the same way that you learned a little bit about walking someone through a narrative, as you just went went through, um, what's what's different about the types of uh, tricks that you would do on Scam School with with friends that you typically do in a bar? So here here is this is what I love about interviews like this is I get to say out loud things that I will never say out loud on the actual program. Um, a, a good brand, a good story, is secretly one thing that pretends to be another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, think of about a comic book movie that's secretly a coming of age film. Think about a love story that is secretly about uh, uh, learning to love yourself, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, when I pitched Scam School, for the first two or three years, 
I never once said the, the M word. I never once admitted in any venue that we were teaching magic. I insisted that uh, because uh, in your mind, picture a Venn diagram where you draw a circle, people who want to learn magic, uh, okay, it's whatever size that is, now draw a picture, uh, a circle called people who want to be the most interesting person at the bar <laughs> and get free drinks. It's mm -hmm. probably a bigger circle, right? So, so I insisted that that's what the show was about. Secretly, just week after week, it just happened to be that the best method was a magic trick. <laughs> and so, right. and so in this, in this regard, you know, I, I, I kept that secret. Uh, also, this is the kind of venue where I get to reveal the big secret, which is also the secrets of magic that work at the bar to get a free drink happen to be the same secrets that are on TV and major yeah. stage shows and all of that stuff. And, uh, this goes back to the chess metaphor. Like I just want more and better chess players. I want, I want, I want a uh, young, old, male, female, every ethnicity, every economic status. I want everybody playing chess. And if I have to deny that what I'm actually doing is teaching chess, then so be it. That's fine with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm personally a, a big, I've, I always have a handful of, of bar tricks. Um, uh, I spend a lot of time at the, at, at the bars downtown here. And, uh, you know, I'm always up for doing something like that. Uh, but what, you know, if you do it enough, what, at some point you realize that, that, if it if you present it as a fun little gag with your friends, it's lighthearted and it's a source of entertainment. But a lot of these, um, a lot of the types of stunts that you present, there's a there's a dark version of many of them, right? They that 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 there are versions that that are called con schemes, con scams, or and uh, you know uh, I, I, I learned. Mean, I mean, of, of yeah. course, that's the reason that it's called scam school, right? right. Is, is because of the connotation, because you're right. The, uh, it turns out they are the exact same methods, only one, you know, the, the light side of the force is using them to entertain, amuse, deepen your relationships with other people, score free beers. Uh, the dark side is, of course, to defraud and take away uh, something from somebody else. Um, uh, uh, one, one quick note uh, on scam school, scam nation, like we had to pick some kind of dividing line. And for me, the dividing line was everything we teach on that show. Uh, number one, either we have to know the person who created it and have permission or two, it, uh, it, it has to be so old and the creator dead so that we feel okay about sharing it. Number, uh, number three, nothing that requires you to go to a magic shop to buy stuff. It's not that I have anything against magic shops. It's against, it's just that not all of us live near them. And right. when you get it, once you get a few emails from, I don't know, a 14 year old in Bulgaria talking about how important your magic lessons were and how he made his own uh, uh, Mark deck at home or whatever, it's really hard to feel good about saying like, you know, you can only do this trick if you buy this gizmo. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the world of cons, that's something that I've, I've enjoyed the halo around with Scam School, Scam Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, but but now with the new project, uh, World's Greatest Con, we're really able to dive in on, and it is astonishing to see uh, that that my casual claim that I made just now of about how one-on-one -on -one performance, same thing on a big stage show, turns out same thing on the world stage. Uh, season one of World's Greatest Con is all about how the Allies manufactured a con to, to fool Hitler into expecting an attack on the wrong front. And uh, it, it involves everything from the creator of James Bond to you know the, the difficult question of what happens when you get a dead body and, and, and the foot is too frozen to fit inside a, a boot. Like, like these are real visceral questions that, that magicians deal with every day, but most people don't pause to think about. Uh, yeah, that sounds super interesting. I, I, I'll definitely uh, put links into the episode uh, once once this this comes out, uh, to, so you can check that out. Um, obviously, the the theme, right, right. You have a personal interest in all of these sort of different different ways that that people can be conned. Um, I, I, 
learned very late in life what con actually stood for. I didn't realize that con meant confidence, that the, right. the whole point of a con is that you're giving the, the victim confidence and that's how you execute these types of things. And, um, and also you yeah. are acting with confidence, right? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the difference between a David Copperfield and an awkward kid trying to do a card trick is like David Copperfield will let you pick a card. The kid will ask if you would pretty please pick a card. So why do you think cons are so effective? Uh, there was a casual throwaway phrase that ended up being the cornerstone. And we say it at the beginning of every single episode of World's Greatest Con. Cons don't fool us because we're stupid. They fool us because we're human. Mm -hmm. And that's why this particular episode might be about the world's greatest con. Um, here's, a, here's a reframe of things. Um, if I were to draw two lines that were clearly exactly uh, the same length, and then I drew outwards pointing arrows on one line and inwards pointing arrows on the other, you would recognize it as a very famous optical illusion. And even though your eyes would tell you that one line is bigger than the other, you would understand that this is not an indication of you being a sucker or anything emotionally charged one way or the other. You would be all like, huh, yep, that's how eyes work. Uh, once you admit that you are capable of being fooled and once you read enough and learn enough about memory science to understand that almost everything you remember is wrong. Once you let go of those things, my goodness, there's a freedom that you couldn't possibly believe. Like relationships, me and my wife don't argue about things because if she remembers something different than me, I say, yeah, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and, and likewise, once you open up yourself to the idea that you can always be deceived, whenever somebody wants to be a malicious actor, uh, it, it, it um, I don't know, it makes a bigger, more open world. And that's what we're trying to convey in World's Greatest Con is, is it's not bad to be the sucker. It just means that you were the audience for this particular performance. Right. Yeah, I, 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 the, I, I like the, that you're highlighting that it has, uh, little to nothing to do with intelligence, right? Because these are human blind spots, right? They're, they're just, they're, we have a certain way of thinking. We have patterns of thinking. It's hardwired to a certain extent, but when there are these institutions and, and um, uh, ideas and concepts in the world of the con that exploit our default behaviors. And, and it really doesn't, it, you know, I think I, I've, talk to a lot of people and, and I, you know, I'm always the champion for like, just be clear. This isn't, you are not foolish for falling for these. These are designed to work on, they're not designed to work on 10% of the population. I mean, there are cons, you know, you, your email con, whatever you get stuff in the email clickbait and stuff like that. Those might work on a very low percentage of the population, but um, a, a real a, a talented con artist, um, these, these work on, on, on a high percentage of people, or at least it's, they're intended to. And, and to be honest, it's the same fundamentals. Remember, we began the discussion by talking about the psychological blind spots. If I wanted to fool you with a very good magic act, it would never occur to you that I would fly out and recon your place a week beforehand. Right. Now, if you're somebody who does a million dollar deal every week for a million dollars, I'll come out a week ahead and, and, and uh, recon yeah. an area and set things up. I'll hire extras to casually mention that they're fans of my podcast or, or recognize me. Aren't you the guy that uh, had the tip on, on mm. crypto nine, seven, two, five or whatever, like all of a sudden those things become worthy investments. And when the target is somebody where a million dollar deal gone bad is a rounding error, all of a sudden the math just works out where it's like, yeah, go ahead and make that scratch off lottery ticket and go for it. Yeah. I have one more question before we wrap up. And that has to do with the value of learning magic. You've, uh, you've 
practiced magic in one way or another for for many years suppose that you had to pitch to a young person uh you know what why what is the value of getting into magic and, and learning magic in the first place what would you say to them uh there's a difference between knowing something academically or having heard about something academically and internalizing it to a level where you recognize it the moment you feel anything close to it. And the most shining example of that in my life was I had dabbled a little bit in magic. Uh, it wasn't the reading about magic that tipped me off to this. It wasn't the understanding that other people could do a thing. It was the doing of magic that caused me to recognize a crime in progress. When I was 17 years old, I was working a cash register at a movie theater. Somebody walked in. It was a two-person team. Person two immediately walked to the far end of the counter and said, I want to know about the differences between all these candies. And you know, the other person walks down and explains the difference between a milk dud and a Whopper or whatever, which already I'm thinking, that's a very odd thing. And the guy orders a small soda. And I'm like, that is demonstrably the worst product to buy at this concession stand and they're not coming to see a movie and then he goes on to explain that he has a big uh, a, a poker game that night and he needs lots of change and hundred dollar bills are out and he's getting 20s and there's 20s and fives and ones and oh no no wait we have too many fives what we need is more of the 20s and at some point i was like wait uh, which was uh, and and then he reminds me and i'm like oh yes yes okay that's what it was and then the moment it all ended and the cash register closed, they left and I turned to my friend and said, I think we just got robbed. And it wasn't anything about the words he used. It wasn't anything about the nature of the exchange of money. It was about the cadence and rhythm. And the only reason I recognized it is because I knew what it felt like. I knew in my gut what it feels like to try to push somebody forward through the process of a magic trick. And that is the reason I want every human being to know five good magic tricks, really good magic tricks that they've actually, I need everybody to understand what it feels like to pull it off on somebody else so that they recognize when somebody's trying to pull it off on them. Yeah, I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that. I was working at a coffee shop in the early 2000s and uh someone came in and uh i i hope i'm remembering this correctly because I, in my head i learned this from watching penn and teller's bullshit but um because there's a little piece on there about this idea called uh, change racing which is what you is sort of, it sounds like what you were talking it's, about I, where, i've heard it called change raising i learned it as uh the short change uh when i first uh, found okay. out what it was, uh, but 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 it's called yeah. many different things number one scam globally it's incredible wow yeah i i uh i re i distinctly remember um someone asked for change i, I made a, a simple I gave them, you know, five ones for a five or something like that. And then there was the, the, the second lap is where my, my, the bells and whistles started going off. And I immediately, I immediately, you know, started thinking like this, now something doesn't feel right. This, this reminded me of, of, um, of this, this bit on, on, on Penn and Teller bullshit. And it, it, I guess I, I didn't realize it was that common of a, of a, of a scam. Oh yeah, and uh, uh, that's part of what I love about, um, uh, I don't know, uh, psychological demonstrations like uh, the invisible gorilla or, or, or uh, in right. the case of change raising or the short change, there's some kind of pattern interruption that breaks the flow just enough that when you try to come back to what the numbers were, the other person is able to flatly say, no, we were at blank, blank, and blank, because remember that? and the easiest thing to do is to collapse that discomfort with all of the possibilities and keep on going. And of course, they're going to collapse it at a place where they're already ahead. Uh, are there are there any other ways in which the the value of magic presents itself outside of the stage, outside of of performance? Not right. Not just the 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 act of doing and learning, but just regular everyday 
encounters where you find yourself applying something that you wouldn't have otherwise if you hadn't been uh, in this area for so long? Um, part, in this imaginary scenario where everybody on the planet learns five good magic tricks, right. um, I, I think that there would be fewer false arrests out there because there would be less of a reliance on eyewitness testimony because uh, magicians, like I, I would go back to a college year after year after year, and I would hear people who I remembered seeing them, they worked the gig last year, and they would describe back to me the show I did, and it was very clear that they were conflating two or three different routines. And, and I knew the routines because they're always the same every night, and, and, but they, were, they would be insistent on exactly how it went. And uh, again, these are very subtle things, but I think they're profound. And, and that's part of the reason that I'm so, <laughs> it's, I mean, as you can imagine, uh, being a guy on the internet teaching magic tricks, uh, there's some number of people who, would pr who rather like the idea of learning about chess being illegal. <laughs> and, and, and they're not fans of mine, but I do feel like I'm serving a greater moral good by educating as many people as I can into uh, the deceptions, not only that you could perform on other people, but that you could perform on yourself. Well, that does it. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me today and uh, uh, allowing myself and the listeners to take a, a peek behind the curtain and, uh, and, and to, to learn a little bit about deception. It was, it was uh, a pleasure talking to you today. Brian Brushwood. Dude, so excited. That was great. For more on Brian, visit his website, schwood.com. That's S-H-W-O-O-D.com. Or check out his podcast, World's Greatest Con, at World's Greatest Con. Fireside. FM, or wherever podcasts are found. I've listened to the first two episodes so far, which detail how during World War II, the Allied forces devised a scheme to fool Hitler and end the war. This story is absolutely riveting. Each episode weaves a compelling narrative about one aspect of this insanely complex plot and includes music and sound effects to really draw you in. I highly recommend it. Be sure to follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on iTunes. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or Twitter at WDWDTPod. As always, feel free to email me at Why Do We Do That Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question, why do we do that? <laughs>